would just go around to campsites and festivals and if I saw somebody dancing and I liked the step, I would I would just be very brazen about going up and asking them to teach me. Sometimes I got a yes, sometimes a, a very cold shoulder and no. And, but in general it was very, uh, people are very willing to share things. Uh, I guess it's just the region we're in, but people are friendly and they just consider a real compliment that somebody wants to learn. If you want to know anything about the Greengrass Cloggers, even though she joined in the 90s, she knows more about us than anyone possibly because she's just gotten her Master's of Fine Arts in uh, Creative Writing. What a subject. She, she chose the Greengrass Cloggers as her thesis. And she has researched, detailed research. It's, it's scary. She knows everything. The later 60s and the early 70s, there was a contingent of students from ECU and faculty also who were interested in the kind of music during the, the folk movement, bluegrass and old time. And they would travel up there in mass, but it wasn't always for the music. A lot of them went because by that time the festival had become a huge party. It started in 1924, and then by the 70s it was getting to be really huge. So it was giant circus tent, hot air balloons, <laughs> all kinds of things like that. And so Dudley went really for the party and saw the Smoky Mountain Cloggers there and was just totally amazed. When after I saw the Smoky Mountain Cloggers at Union Grove, that was pretty much it. You know, I knew I had to do it. Earl was like the ambassador for clogging, so he would like invite people, come to clogging practice, come to clogging practice, come to clogging practice. And that's where I met you, Dudley, is that right? That's right, I had paint on my clothes. Oh yeah. And Dudley, what did you think? Do you remember your first impression of Pam? I thought she was cute, yeah. I, I thought, thought you were a, a drip. sloppy, <laughs> Sweaty. Never washed your hair, and um, always had paint on your clothes. Gee, thanks. But you were very soft-spoken. Tony's responsibility was to call the men and remind them of clogging practice on Sunday evenings. And it was Dudley's responsibility to call the women. And I remember he had um, a very... Great phone voice. <laughs> in Greenville at the time when they first started, even though in other parts of the country there, there were large counterculture movements, it was a lot smaller here. And the way Tony tells it, it really needed that connection with the other long haired students or with the other girls who wore jeans on campus because in the late 60s, women still had to wear skirts or if they were wearing pants, it had to be a long coat that came down close to their knees. It was a reference to bluegrass because I think at the time I wasn't real, real clear about the difference between old time and bluegrass. So it was a reference to bluegrass. It was a reference to <laughs> recreational grass. Back then, it was called grass. <laughs> And a lot of us like to do that. Um, and also just that, oh, the green grass of home, or the green grass which was there, that pasture over there, you know, where it's always greener. So, all of that. And I just threw it out and everybody said, yeah, let's do that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for some real tough clogging now, huh? All right, this is a group from Greenville. What is it? What is it? Greenville, North Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina. Where are they from? North Carolina. All right, that's what I thought. All right, from Greenville, North Carolina, the Green Grass Crackers, everybody. <laughs> Did you compete? 
we competed and we won first place in the traditional category. And how where, was that? Did you think that that might happen, or was that no, a total shock? No, not a clue. Not a clue. I mean, we practiced at the last minute. Every people were off in different directions, but it did. An hour before the the competition, it did come together, and we did the ending, and it worked. <laughs> Did you guys seem like you'd just come out of nowhere to the other clogging teams? I guess. Uh, you know, they, they weren't too pleased to have lost to us, you know, these upstarts. Did you feel like you had invented something new? No. No, because I hadn't invented anything new. <laughs> and the only thing that really made us different is our lifestyle. We weren't all polyester and white bread and you know we had some soul you know and a lot of those people were just too plastic I guess. I was working at East Carolina University in the cafeteria and a guy that was working with me Earl White was um, being in there kind of dancing around while we were working in the cafeteria and I saw him and asked him what it was he was doing and he told me he was clogging to uh, Rod Stewart on the jukebox. I went down and watched the team dance and I was just caught up with their enthusiasm. So I asked Earl right after then, said, how can I get involved? And he said, well, you have to go see Dudley and Dudley will show you how to become a clogger. So it didn't really work out so good. I spent it about 15 or 20 minutes with me. Dudley told me that he didn't think I'd ever be able to learn how to do that. So I was kind of discouraged, but I wouldn't go away. <laughs> I just kept coming back, and Earl was finally able to teach me the basic step of the green grass cloggers. The very basic step uh, consists of a shuffle and a step. So and just breaking it down very slowly, you're going to go shuffle, step, 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 shuffle, step, step, step. One, two, three. One, two, three, and a one, two, three, and a one, two, three. So where I'm saying and a, that's where your shuffle's going to come. So you want to catch the floor on your way out and catch the floor on your way back. So you have shuffle, and then you have a step, rock step, which is just stepping on whatever foot you shuffled with, and then rocking back, and then back onto the foot you shuffled with. So shuffle, step, rock, step. Then you're ready to do it on the other foot. Shuffle, step, back, step. Shuffle, step, back, step. Shuffle, step, back, step. and the green grass cloggers. We were all learning how to live together, interact together, and learning about the music and the dance, and it was just incredibly eye-opening um, and formative. We were babies. I was 20. I think we gave it a broader appeal, and it did appeal to all, it went across all classes of people, all ethnic groups, I mean, it, it just seemed like the common denominator. People, all types of people loved it. Our routines were short. They weren't long and drawn out. They were well choreographed um, by a group effort. They, they moved quickly. They had lots of color and action. And, um, and we were kind of hip, you know, and accepted with open arms among the folk community. So we were looked at by the folks in the folk community, except at the National Folk Festival, as, as folkies. Of course, the National Folk Festival, when they found out that we, we didn't all learn from our parents, 
said, well, you're, you're a revisionist, you're not true traditionalist, so. Some of the festivals that we used to go to took offense when we were described as traditional cloggers. They said, no, that's not traditional clogging. And in many forms, I understood that. I knew that we weren't, uh, some of our routines and things were just the opposite of that. They were innovative and, and different, the high kicks and uh, that type of thing. On the other hand, we were doing exactly what tradition uh, calls for or is made of. We were going and learning from folks like Robert Dotson or from Hansel Aldridge or Willard Watson, those types of people that came from the culture and passed it along. We were there to soak it up and had the opportunity to do that and to learn some of those steps. We heard comments like, this is the way clogging used to be in Asheville. There's the spirit, the whole spirit is the passion for it is what maybe was missing a little bit at that time frame in the early 70s. And I think we helped bring that passion back to people involved with this dance style. Did you ever feel like rock stars in those first couple of years? In Philadelphia, we did. We, we were because they went crazy. They loved us. And they went nuts over us. And we went nuts over them. The one, I guess, if there's one memory of, of that was Union Grove in 1973. There were, again, according to estimates, there were something like 70,000 people there. And it felt like when we danced, it felt like every one of those people was in the tent. Because we danced, it was late at night, and of course what we do is so high energy, it gets the audience involved. And when you finish a dance and you're coming off stage and you're hearing literally thousands of people clapping and screaming and stomping their feet, uh, of course, the first thing that happens, your ego becomes the size of a mushroom cloud. And, uh, but it's just, it's such a wonderful experience to feel that. And to get back to your question, absolutely. It made you feel like you were, you know, you were the Beatles. <laughs> you know? I got to call a square dance for 4,000 people. And to me, I mean, how many times you get to do that? And, and to dance in front of 50,000 people and they, just, they went nuts because they'd never seen anything like it. And then the backstage just being full of people wanting interviews and to talk about it and workshops and learn how to do this. So it spawned this whole uh, second generation culture after that of people interested in this music and dance. And that, how can that not be good? You know? We got a loan to get the bus. Uh, we pulled it all together and um, went for it. Um, I, you know, almost everybody on the group, on the, on the road group, basically moved into my farmhouse for the first little while. And that enabled us to combine our resources to, you know, to, the house payment wasn't that much. That first year, when we traveled in the summer, we had a vase on the, on the, um, dashboard of the bus and wherever we stopped we'd go out and grab every, gather wildflowers and ref, you know put a new bunch of wildflowers in the, in the vase um, it was just it was a lot of fun and and we crammed our bicycles in the back of the bus in the compartment there and when we spent days places we would get out and ride or hike or explore or you know ride into town wherever we were um, it was just, it was great fun. Um, I wouldn't trade anything in the world for it. We met this gentleman I want to bring out right now and get Mr. Robert Dotson to come up here. Uh, we met Robert Dotson in 1977. And uh, Robert lives over close to Boone, North Carolina. Robert had a little step that was, he was doing that was different than anything you bring rest bloggers had seen. Instead of doing this basic step going down and up, he has this little lift up that is a little bit more up and down than the down and up. A little closer in my feelings to the Celtic dancing, the Irish dancing, the stuff where you're going up and down to the music. Robert turned 88 on May the 13th. And we had a great big party for him. And uh, Robert, would you do a little dancing with these guys and get them up here to play a fiddle tune? <laughs>
my memory of the Tennessee walking step is from the first trip that the Greengrass Cloggers took to Robert Dotson's house up in Sugar Grove, North Carolina. Um, probably would have been in 77. I guess building from little sounds to many sounds, like few sounds to many sounds, it would look something like this. What makes this the year of the possum? What's up with possums? Okay, well, the year of the possum, as you might see, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I have on my possum shirt, and it's a tribute to one of the um, two possums that um, the Greengrass Cloggers had as a mascot back in 1978. Uh, Rodney came across this possum in the road. Well, actually, the possum was deceased, but had two young ones that were still uh, alive and so he took them in and named them Alfred and Xenia. And they became pets of the green grass cloggers. We fed them with a little eyedropper and little baby bottles and we raised them and kept them in a little um, little cage, I guess you would call it. It was really like a little portable grill. Kept them on the bus. They traveled with us. Um, the little female possum Xenia died after just a couple of weeks. But Alfred, the possum that survived, um, traveled with us from April through September. And my hair was uh, more afro-ish, I guess, back in those days. And so Alfred and Xenia could burrow down in there and have a nice little nest. And it didn't bother me too much. I sort of liked the massage I was getting every now and then with their claws. And uh, we would be talking and cutting up and doing different things. And someone would ask me something. I said, I don't know. I'm, 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 the only songs I can think of are possum songs. I've got possum on my brain. And often this was at a school show and I'd end up taking off the hat and here were these two possums and the kids just loved that. And um, we learned a lot about possums. We learned a lot that, um, you know, from watching Alfred and observing him. They, he'd get on his back legs and take his paws and if you're feeding him like apples, he would be pushing the apples in with his front paws as fast as he put it in his mouth. And he couldn't swallow it as fast as he was trying to eat it, so it would mush back out and run down the sides of his mouth. So they were like, we, we felt like, especially Amy and I, we studied on Alfred a lot and how come he happened into our lives. And there's a reason that we had this possum because you find out pretty quick that possums don't really have any kind of a game plan in life. They just like kind of wander around aimlessly until they find something to eat and then they eat it all at one time. And it kind of like seemed like that's what the Greengrass Cloggers were doing a lot in those early days on the road. It's like we didn't really have a big game plan. We would go off and take a job somewhere and we'd be there and it'd be time to go back to Greenville. And somebody would say, well, hey, uh, just about 50 miles from here, we know where there's gonna be a party and they're gonna have a keg of beer and it's gonna be a good time. Your guys should go over there. And we'd say, okay, well, we'll go over there. We'll just go home tomorrow. So we'd just take off and Sometimes we were even going in the wrong direction. We didn't even know if we had enough money to get back home. You know, maybe you don't have the biggest, <laughs> the biggest uh, success strategy, but somehow through it all, the green grass cloggers have managed to survive over 40 years. And that can't be said from a lot of the other groups that kind of spun off from us. And I still have Alfred to remind us of all those early days. I keep him in a little pizza box. He's completely flat. And uh, I'll just show up to you real briefly. I've had him in this pizza box for uh, 30, 32 years. And uh, this is the short version. So there's Alfred. And uh, he still looks pretty much like he did back then. He's never smelled. He's still like our inspiration. That's kind of, he's still got this grin on his face. You know, he's still smiling. That's what you do when you're clogging, no matter what kind of mistake you make. Just remember to keep smiling. So there's Alfred. That's the short version. When I met the cloggers, they had made the transition from being a bunch of friends who were learning together 
to being a semi-professional and the growing pains related to who's going to get to be a professional and who's going to stay home to I came in a year into the professional where they had already had it out with each other. Some people had left. When you look at the, at the film footage over the course of the years, you'll note that when we got into those, those years in the late 70s and early 80s, we cleaned up, we cut our hair shorter. When I joined the group, the group was wanting not to be seen as a bunch of hippie stompers, but as more of a professional dance company. So we, we took it that way. Um, I went all over the world with the Cloggers. In the course of it, we won two Emmys for dance in shows. I met remarkable people. Um, most of my life came together in part because of going off to dance with the Cloggers. Spent time in Florida, and then we'd go shoot up to Maine, and then we'd be down in New Orleans and just, just all over the place. Uh, and I, I loved it. It was a group of, um, of young, exciting, attractive, outgoing, for the most part, athletic, really talented people. Uh, when we went to Singapore on behalf of Hardy's Hamburgers. Oh. Hardy's is based in North Carolina, and they wanted some North Carolina music and dance. But probably the highlight of the international stuff was a five-week State Department tour to South and Central America. One of the things that we discovered in South America is, is that people there, they had no idea that there was folk music or folk dance from this country. All they knew about was Michael Jackson. And so they were, they were stunned that there was a folk music and dance tradition here and they were very interested in it. Now let me give you another little piece here. Um, talent agency in New York City came and watched us to consider whether they would be our agent. They rated us and then they proceeded to tell us that if we would put sequins <laughs> on our costumes and um, a few other little, you know, frilly things like that, that uh, they would consider being our agent. And we said, thank you very much. We don't think we if need. you've been around the Poggers, it's chaotic and argumentative and sometimes ugly, sometimes loving and wonderful. Um, very, our last routine we made up actually was called Chaos, but it was that chaos that, and lack of organization that allowed everyone's input to become part of the routine, whereas almost all groups um, are choreographed by one person. We are truly just a mess. You know, we're a, a melting pot of great ideas and it made it what it is. I will have to make this disclaimer. There's a great argument about which is the right way to do the Jerry. And since the team has been going for 40 years and there's been so many different people in the team, everybody has their opinion about how, well, what? I learned it this way. So that, uh, you know, you feel like you're, you learned it the right way. I feel like I learned it the right way. Other people say, no, it's not like that, it's like this. So we have that with almost every step, practically. Back, step, shuffle, back. And I throw my, my foot back. Catch, forward, back. With a chug on one leg. So that's the Jerry. I like that step. In the early part of the 2000s, um, Phil Jameson started getting some offers and contacts to um, get, quote, the road team, reunion team back together. And we would only get together to rehearse 
two or three times right before a job. And um, personally, I didn't feel like that we were delivering. The energy wasn't there um, for me with the four couples, and we weren't that sharp. I have always thought that it would be great to have our kids dance, but even if they weren't our kids, that the generations that come along see what we do, and it it just wows them, and they they it gets into them so much that they they got to do it. I was friends with Trina Royer, and she was hoping they would invite some new people to dance with Greengrass because they're all like, oh, my knee, oh, my back. <laughs> or like, I can't do gigs. I don't know. I just, I'm tired. <laughs> all right, so ladies, chain. Wait, now go pick him up with the left, left his little right hand. So I was, I was raised in, with, in like the folk music bubble. Um, and um, I had an opportunity sort of where I could have rebelled when I was like a teenager, but I really didn't want to. Um, because I really love square dancing and I love singing ballads. When we were younger and Phil Jameson came to call dances at the folk school and he's so tall and um, I remember just being struck by him as a caller. She had a crush and on had, him. As a dancer. She was three years old. And <laughs> as a three year old asking him to dance. I didn't want to dance with anybody else but him. As kids we were around all the folkies that either played old time music or might have participated in something like Greengrass. And my first impression was they traveled on the road and they won awards and they wore really colorful dresses and it must be awesome to dance with them. I grew up with dance such as Jazzercise and music such as Rolling Stones, Thriller and Enya. That's what I remember. And that was like my, my like, passed on from previous generations, dancing and music experience. Um, and stories and lineage in general are pretty blurry. Like I've, I've asked, I remember asking my grandfather at one point like about our ancestry and he's all like, what does it matter, we're all American. I've always wanted to be on a clogging team. I, I didn't know I would be part of such a tradition. But um, yeah, I started dancing in South Dakota. Uh, I remember it was winter, and I, I, I pulled a piece of, of plywood into my room and started chugging on it, and uh, my roommates thought I was crazy, but... Bringing on this new influx of new energy and youth and returning to the two set uh, format, it's just, it's wonderful. It's like those beginning years in the early 70s when you had that kind of energy. I've had so many people say to me, what I saw you do was the most exciting thing I've seen the Green Grass Cloggers do in 20 years, and I think they're right. It just inspires me. Just the youth, the enthusiasm, um, it's, it's wonderful. I, I get a whole lot more out of it than probably anybody realizes. And I was wondering, does it feel strange in the 70s, you were there, you were learning from 
Willard and hang out with Tommy Gerald, and they were your elders, and now to find yourself to be someone who's looked at as an elder. <laughs> it doesn't seem that long ago. <laughs> it's my first comment about that. Um, because they were so open to us and taught us things and, and accepted us, I think that sh that laid the, the game plan out for us. You know, it's got to be that way. And that's, you know, that's the way traditional music was passed on for all those years. Tradition to me is not a stagnant thing, it is growth. And the analogy I like to use is Bill Monroe was considered radical when his music came out in the early 40s. Bluegrass, what is that? That's not country music, that's not hillbilly music or old time, that's radical stuff. And then when uh, New Grass Revival came along, all of a sudden here's this New Grass style that Bill Monroe couldn't grab onto because it wasn't traditional bluegrass. Well, again, tradition grows, it's not stagnant. And it's great to see that other people appreciate what we've contributed to this culture and are willing to carry it on in this style. When I was in my 20s and discovering old time square dancing, I, I wanted to learn from the old folks. But at, at some point I realized that you start looking around and the old, older generation is no longer there. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting because I used to go interview people, older people, and uh, starting to find that happen coming back at me now. Coming in in the 40th year, it's just kind of like we want to take in as much information as there is available because like we've been talking about, we want to be able to carry this on until the 80th anniversary. So we're trying to like glean as much of that knowledge and have all those stories and wisdom and dances within us so that we can keep carrying it on for more generations. For people like Andy and I to come from across the country and want to be a part of this, I think it's so important to, to do what Andy's doing and, and to give respect to the people that, that do know how to play old time music and that do know how to dance. And like Robert Dotson, who's been dancing for since he was a boy, you know, and to respect that and learn from them and watch them and listen to them and listen to them and listen to them. Yeah. You know, I think that's definitely one huge component of old time music. Right. It's really interesting to see how the music, old time music and dance scene is, appears to be blossoming right now and as it was in the 70s. In the 70s it was, it was a huge thing and there were uh, there were string bands all over the place. So people that didn't grow up in the country and didn't grow up with old time and didn't grow up dancing were really into this, like really passionate about it and moving their children to the country or whatever. Um, and I think that could have coincided with the general philosophy that was happening for young people in the 70s and why, how Greengrass kind of started, mixing people that did not grow up in the South at all who were excited about Southern culture and Appalachian traditions and, and really interested in hanging out with old people and learning from them. I think recession is good for folk music and clogging. When the economy's bad, we start saying, wait a minute, how did my grandfather do that? Uh, and you know, the folk revival, the rolling folk revival, if you look historically back over it in the, in the you know, the Great Depression brought a folk revival. <laughs> and we, we were a part of a folk revival. And there's a, I think there's maybe another folk revival going on now. So you step forward, slide back on the same foot. So step full weight, slide it back. Step all the way down, slide it back. Step, slide, step, slide. Yeah, so cross back, cross back, cross back. Yeah. You know, I think people are after something true and real right now. And, and old time music and clogging is just that. It's like real and authentic and heart-centered. Everybody listens to the radio or to the MP3 players. Everybody does. But most people are sucked into the pop culture which is managed by these huge machines and the artists also, a lot of times lose the autonomy of who they are because they've signed to a contract with a big company that makes them make their music sound this way or that way and we get to do it any way we want to do it. I wish everybody could experience what I'm experiencing here. To me, it's music of the people, by the people and for the people. It's homemade music.
trip down to Bolivia and uh, after a week of, of uh, farming and working together in a small uh, Andean mountain community, uh, they got their pan pipes and their drums out and they all grabbed hands in a big circle and just did circle dances for a long while. And I, uh, I don't know if it's a kind of, a kind of primal connection of rhythmic dance or certainly something sacred about uh, community gathering hands in a circle. That's the best of it with green grass cloggers is whether it's performance or workshop or just a regular old practice is that at some point you just feel the absolute freedom of, of uh, turning your body loose and knowing that you're not doing it alone but uh, you get to grab a hand and uh, circle around. That's a good idea. So let's, let's kind of do it chronologically rather than randomly. So if you join original members first, original members, and, and then other people in the 70s, original members, and how many originals do we have here? All originals. All originals. Let's, let's first of all see if we can get just a picture of the very first folks that danced in 1971. If you were dancing in 71, when they won the world championship. Earl. started with these folks. Uh, give your name, the year you started. It's not obvious that everybody started in <laughs> the beginning. And uh, what you've been up to? There's like 180 ex-cloggers, is that, I mean, somewhere around there? And there were a bunch of them there, you know? And, and just to be a part of this long lineage and, and to meet these people that you hear all these stories about, it, the 40th reunion was absolutely fantastic, I thought. Yeah, I thought so too. And it really made me realize what I'm a part of now. To me, it's more like a big family reunion of friends that are my family that I may not see all the time, but we have a lot in common psychically somehow. There's the idea of playing possum, like possums play dead and then they come back because they're not actually dead. And there's so much resilience in the history of the cloggers that's just like the possum. And that's not really the way the, the metaphor started. Like you've got this on film from other people, but at that time the kind of thought Alfred was, or that they had been acting like possums, like not having a game plan and then maybe they should. But I think, yes, the the meaning of the possum now has changed and maybe that is about resilience. In the old time community and you know festivals people know about the green grass cloggers and, and they love the green grass cloggers and there's so much history and I hope that that we do bring it forward and we're not just a a retro act or mm -hmm. something like that. They were relevant and people I hope there's young kids out there now then you know they see us and they're like man I hope I can be a green grass clogger.
Now, a lot of people don't know what clogging is, so explain what clogging is. Okay, well, clogging's uh, really a melting pot dance here in America. It started way back when, when the settlers were coming. It takes a lot of the English and the step dancing of the Irish, which are upbeat, and combines that with the African rhythms and the American Indian rhythms, too, so it gives the downbeat type. So a lot of the dance. folks uh, originally brought it here and kind of developed it here in the mountain culture? Right, it was a social dance, and uh, they got together for their barn raisins or after the harvest came in and had a big time. Thank you. 